Do you remember Metroid Zero Mission on the Game Boy Advance? Because I don't. It's been over 20 years since I first played it, a remake of the original NES classic, but modernized with abilities now staples to the franchise, more bosses, and even extra plot. Plus it has save rooms now, so no more passwords. With it now added to Switch Online, I figured it's the perfect time to dive back in and a nice conclusion to my mini Metroidvania marathon I've been doing lately. So while we're still waiting for Metroid Prime 4, here's everything from my most recent playthrough. A nice refresher for those of you who haven't touched in a while, as well as a mini review of why it's just a better method to experience Samus' first mission than the original. Spoilers, of course, for those of you still waiting to play this 20-year-old game. The game's menu alone is a nice callback to the original, showing just the planet's surface while a new version of the original theme plays, giving us a taste of how good this new soundtrack is going to be. Starting it up, the game opens the same way as most Metroids do, Samus getting a mission and coming down to the planet. We're given a little monologue from her and after that, we're let out into the world. Before starting, however, I just wanted to point out her spaceship in this game. This thing is ugly. There's been a few different ships over the franchise, but I personally just hate everything about this one. It just looks like some kind of space boomerang. Now back to the game. The opening room is basically a one-to-one -one copy of the original Metroid. Even Super Metroid honors this iconic room, and in all three of those games, of course, going left is the best move here, because the Morph Ball is just sitting there, asking to be picked up. After getting that, it's time to start the adventure. I'm immediately blocked by a Chozo statue, looking to help, of course, as it provides me with a map and marker for the next objective which guides us directly to getting the long beam, as well as leading us to the statue room, which is definitely more impactful than the original Metroid statue room, but definitely not as cool as the one in Super Metroid. Next, I make my way down another shaft to come to the first essential skill to open more doors, the missile upgrade. What's odd is while I'm doing all these opening parts, my memories of the original NES version keep coming back. I know the missiles were here, and I know we're going back up the shaft next, but all I can see is the 8-bit Samus doing all this in my mind. It's more ingrained into me, maybe because I kept trying to play this game when I was too young, as I would only get so far before restarting. Whoa! Okay, well this didn't happen in the original. Yes, one of the new bosses is this big centipede thing that immediately requires spamming our small pool of missiles at while I dodge its attacks. It runs away though, out of fear I bet, and I'm able to get back to exploring, finding my first energy tank and another essential ability, bombs, which I'm sure at this point we all know how they work. This is how it works. I plant a bomb and it'll explode soon after that. What's cool is that after those Chozo statues offer you their item, they act as a refuel station, maxing out both your health and ammo. Along the way, I also found some extra missile tanks. I likely won't be talking about missile upgrades much, simply because of how many there are throughout this game. I then started to kind of miss Fusion's ability to hang from ledges. So many platforms were just out of my reach in this, and I was so used to grabbing ledges after playing Metroid Fusion earlier this year. After getting told to get out of Brinstar and head to Norfair, I couldn't leave without first having my rematch with Diorum and finishing them off, rewarding me with the charge beam for some reason. He's gonna give me an ability? I wasn't expecting charge from that. On leaving Brinstar, we're given a nice little cinematic of Mother Brain spying on Samus' arrival. These little scenes are just the cherry on top for why this game is better than playing the original. Just lets you know what else is going on around this planet, other than Samus blasting everything she sees. Next up is Norfair, but not venturing too far before saving, just to be safe. My Norfair visit is cut short though, as I immediately find an elevator to Criteria in the Chozo Ruins leading me to the new item. For now, it doesn't do much. We'll talk about this later, but I can start blasting these glowing blocks for now, guiding me and tricking me into falling into an inescapable pit. Luckily, this pit has a few cracks and I managed to find power grip. I have no idea what power grip is. Well, let me tell you. Remember how I wished earlier that this game you could ledge grab like in Fusion? Grab and hang. Oh, okay, you can grab ledges in this game. Yeah, now I'd say Samus has all the fundamentals. I find it weird this is an upgrade for Samus as it should just be a natural skill for her. Also would like to point out, look at this statue. The Chozo definitely put more effort into this guy than the rest. Odd that it's guarding one of the most basic skills, however. Soon enough, I find Samus's ugly ship and decide to save, just to be safe, of course. From here, it's now time to head back into Norfair and start poking around for more upgrades. Before diving further into this region, I just wanted to say that Norfair's theme may be the most iconic song to me from the original. This is always a good song. I think it's because I was always stuck in here as a child, trying to find my way out with how many secret walls there were to blast through. My first few rooms here are pretty much dead ends, with a few missiles here and there to tease me to come back and get them later. 
After getting my bearings around the area, I finally find Ice Beam in the Magma Room for some reason, but now I can do the most essential skill from the original, using enemies as platforms. The next Chozo tourist map shows the next objective is to visit Kraid down below. So I tried to make my way back, but I wasn't going to go all the way back without grabbing a few upgrades along the way, too. After coming all the way back to the starting area, I make my way down to the next elevator and enter the next region known as Kraid to get ready to fight Kraid. Now why does this place have the same name as him, you may be asking? Well, similar to Ridley, now living in Ridley, this remake decided to shorten these regions' names. It's actually their layers, and they just decided to not include the full names for the map. Once down here, we're greeted with what I think is the most improved song from the original soundtrack. Just listen to that pixelated choir. Our first contact down here in this region is the goofiest little aliens who still look as goofy in the original. These little guys are the enemies I remember most from the original. They look like crabs with googly eyes, and after making this video I looked them up and yeah, that's exactly what they are. They're also called Zelas. Shortly after them, I'm introduced to these ancient Chozo cannons with that shoot Samus across a room, killing anything in her path. After a few more rooms of blasting, I then reach what I think is a generator. Samus charges it up, providing power throughout Kraid's lair and activating all the hangers on the ceiling, giving some quick movement around the room. Of course, this is immediately followed by a new boss to the franchise, this giant worm thing called Mua. It only had two attacks, it seems, tackle and raise and lower the acid level of the room. It didn't take long to understand what needed to be done here. Simply bait Mua to attack you and grind the rails to safety on the other side. If you bait them on the lower platform, eventually it'll ram itself into cement wall, stunning it for a good chunk of time. After that, just open up your missiles and go to town blasting away. After a few reps, Mua decides to explode and we're free to move on. Not before doing some boss cleanup and restocking, however. After doing a loop around the whole area, I noticed this odd little guy hanging out in the acid. On closer inspection though, it wasn't acid at all. There's was a whole world down there. I was back on track and found the next big ability. Although I couldn't use it yet. Kraid was so close, just a few more twists and turns left. Eventually I did luck out and fell into an acid river that had a path below. Real acid? Pretty sure this isn't the intended way to go, however. My eyes, the goggles do nothing. After making my way further down, I found my way outside Kraid's door finally, ready to see the big guy once more. Upon entering the boss room, we're given a short cinematic introduction to Kraid before we start blasting him. As usual, Kraid doesn't do much besides claws and belly spikes. Just like in Super Metroid, you just need to force feed him some missiles for a bit and eventually he'll get too full and explode. And with that, the first half of the gate was unlocked. While I was waiting for his death animation to finish though, I learned something new about Samus in this game. Does she have wall jump yet? No. Okay. I'm surprised they should- oh, she does have the jump. I was just bad at it. Once Kraid was finally off the screen, I could move in and see what item he was guarding, and it was a biggie. Beep, boop. I was now free to leave Kraid, Zalair, but not before grabbing an E-Tank that has been taunting me since I first arrived here. As I was leaving Kraid, the game wanted to let us know that he was coming. Once you're back in Brinstar, the game tries to jump scare you by introducing the strongest bug on Zebus, who makes a new path for you. Surprise, must One little bug did that! <laughs> this new path only leads to a dead end though, with a Chozo map upgrade. I know Nintendo likes to hold your hand, but I feel this could have been better implemented so it's not just shoehorned in beside you. Why not have the power go out while Samus is in the elevator shaft and has to travel through some vents to get back to Brinstar? Along the way, there could have been a secluded room with the statue that Samus could grab along her escape to get back on track. Speaking of getting back on track, it was long trek back to Norfair to begin the next expedition. I grabbed any upgrades I could find along the way, too. Once I got back down and with the speed booster now equipped, it was time to make a few new paths for myself. Shortly after getting onto the right path, I found high jump, giving me full screen jumps almost. Though my excitement was cut short as the next Chozo map had some bad news for me, sending me all the way back up. So I trekked all the way back up to eventually find a secret ceiling and a new path. It wasn't all bad though, as I learned on the way that I overlooked an ability I got, which would make Morph Ball work a lot easier. Oh, but you can jump! When did I get this? Using High Jump, I'm now able to hop up and reach a new secret path. This path is basically a dead end though, but it's fine because you're here for just one thing, the Varia suit, giving you the means to now venture into acid and prevent heat damage, plus more defense, which always helps. So from here is another trek all the way back down to Norfair to take on the second half of it. 
With the Varya suit, I was now able to enter a lot of hot new rooms, giving me access to new areas as well as discovering the limits of Varya's shielding. Oh no! Real fire! There was no trouble getting to the next power-up, the wave beam, allowing me to now shoot through walls, making most enemies almost worthless now. Makes these fights easier. The next pit stop in Norfair is the big caterpillar room, containing two big indestructible bugs that I thought would be pretty easy to get rid of. Okay, I get it. It all makes sense now. It took me a while to figure out what to do with the second one though. No, it doesn't. It's a trap! <laughs> Came down to me just spamming bombs at the right time. Luckily, my reward for beating them is another energy tank at least. Ooh, okay. Wasn't expecting that kind of upgrade. With me now connecting the two sides of Norfair, it was finally time to head down to Ridley in his lair. But not before taking out this region's boss, a big cocoon. Yeah, it's not that impressive. It doesn't do much besides shoot spores, so all I had to do was avoid them while blasting away at its vines. After enough vines are destroyed, it just falls down, defeated, but opening the next exit in the process. It's free! That can't be the end of the boss fight. <laughs> Is that the end of the fight? There's gotta be more to that. It has to come back and attack me or something. Before entering Ridley's lair, we're shown him finally landing on Zebus and rushing over. He was cutting it close as we had a meeting coming up. Once I arrived, I'm immediately guided to a boss fight. Remember that cocoon I took out a minute ago? It survived. As it dies, it luckily crashes and gives us access to the best kind of missiles. Super! Now it was time for the final sprint to Ridley. Blasting way through this area was pretty simple now with the wave beam. All of his henchmen went down pretty fast while I continued to grab whatever upgrades that weren't nailed down. No, I knew that was going to happen. It was too obvious for it not to happen. After a bit more exploring, I finally found his room. Entering his room was kind of an anticlimactic though, since he was late for the meeting. So while I waited, I decided to go further in and grab another, as well as maybe the most obvious secret in the game. Ooh, that one's kind of a gimme. With everything now collected here, it was time to leave Ridley's lair, but he managed to make it back last minute. Unfortunately, before fighting Ridley, we're given maybe the most abrupt cinematic that used a few too many jump cuts in three seconds. Blink and you'll miss this. That was a fast cin- Like, okay, just a second, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Okay, that was just zoom, 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 start the fight, and then get knocked into the lava. <laughs> it's just very in your face there. The fight plays like every other 2D Ridley fight. Well, maybe not all of them. All that's needed is to avoid his fire breath and tail while blasting away with your missiles. If you stay in front of him too long, he may try to grab you, so keep moving. With how many missiles you have at this point, it's safe to just keep them on and keep firing. Even throw in some super missiles if you got them. Eventually, Ridley finally blows up as his statue lights up as he's defeated. I was surprised how easy he was in this game though, usually Ridley is a decent threat in games. And now it's finally time for Mother Brain. Unfortunately that meant having to climb all the way back up to the top of Corteria. Once I reach Norfair however, another jump scare wall is destroyed and a new path opens. Luckily this one isn't a dead end, instead leads to a cannon shortcut that launches me way up through Norfair, skipping most of it and landing me right in front of the screw attack. What'd I get? Oh, okay. I expect that a little later after fighting Ridley. Now none of these enemies could stop me. After this nice little shortcut, the rest is pretty much just backtracking. I won't bore you with that portion, but it took a while to finally reach the statue room. Again. Now with it being unlocked and wide open, I could go down to see Mother Brain and Turian. Of course, what Metroid game would be complete without its namesake being brought in at some point? Throughout this region, Metroids will spring from the background trying to suck on Samus' energy. Get him off of me! 
As usual though, they aren't that threatening to fight as they can quickly be dealt with using a combination of ice and missiles. For being so powerful, these things only show up for like 5 minutes before you actually get to Mother Brain. Finally, by reaching this save point, we're now right in front of Mother Brain, surrounded by our usual defenses of turrets and flying Cheerios. Just like the original, it's a series of gates that you need to break through using missiles to reach her. Luckily, the Cheerios seem to always spawn missiles on death, so there's no fear of running out. After 4 destroyed gates, I had arrived at Mother Brain ready to do the usual. Anyway, I started blasting. Bah, bah. Unlike in Super Metroid though, this mother brain doesn't put up much of a fight and just accepts her death as her Cheerios just aren't enough to take on late game Samus. Once she's blasted enough, we're given a very anticlimactic death. Of course, with the final boss defeated, you know what that means. Now run! You get two minutes to get out, giving you plenty of time to make a few detours to look for any secrets along the way. Actually, what's down here? Nothing, okay. I didn't find anything unfortunately, but I still had plenty of time to make it back to Samus's UFEU. After boarding we see the usual ending of all Metroids, Samus flying off into space while the planet she just visited blows up in the distance. And with that, Samus's zero mission was over. However, I did lie a bit at the start of this video. There was one thing I remember about this game from the first time I played it. One major thing I remember from so many years ago, it's not over. As a surprise to the players of the original, they added an extra chapter to this game. One where Samus crash lands back on the planet, destroying her ugly ship at least. <laughs> it needs to infiltrate the pirate ship with nothing but her newly revealed Zero suit and a really, really bad pistol to find a new means to escape. This entire section is maybe the only thing I actually remember when I first played the game. Simply due to the sheer impact it had on me and how they added an after story to her escape and introducing us to a new Samus, not relying on her suit but her emergency gear. Instead of blasting her way through as usual, the game now turns into a mini Metal Gear stealth game where being spotted by a space pirate <laughs> makes them all go crazy and chase you relentlessly. Not to mention the damage they can do to you given you have no armor now. Also, there's a nice little easter egg here that during the Zero Suit Samus segment that if you wind up on a menu, Samus' actual head is now used as the cursor instead of her helmet until you reclaim your suit. This segment really puts into perspective how strong her suit actually is, given she is practically useless without it, and the only option you really have is to run away from everything. This section is actually fairly long too for a first playthrough, given you're not really able to just run around like usual, plus it really doesn't... Wait a minute. Wait a minute! She can hang from ledges without the upgrade, even without her suit! What's the point of power grip then? Why make this jacked up statue for such a small unnecessary upgrade? There's no point! As you attempt to sneak around, you wind up in the Chozo Ruins and attempt to make your way to the top to get supplies. One being the power bombs. Oh, there's power bombs. But that is quickly snatched away from you before you can grab it. Hey, where'd the power bombs go? Oh, there they go. After a bit more climbing and sleuthing around, Samus arrives at a shrine from her childhood. Of course nothing's ever easy, and the Chozo rigged it with one final test for Samus, which simply required shooting the big orb when it flashes. Not much of a trial. Upon completion we get our suit back but with a few upgrades. All those locked abilities we found were now compatible with our OS, so we now had access to Space Jump, Plasma Beam, and the good old Gravity Suit. Once we had control again, Samus's theme begins to play as we can start mowing down space pirates with just one shot. This small sequence really shows the power difference between Zero Suit and Armored Samus, and just how powerful she is once she's completely online, which kind of explains why she has to lose her abilities in most games, else you'd be running around one-shotting everything in this god mode. Even though Samus was prepped and ready, there was still one more thing we needed to find in their ship. There it goes! We need it! Got it. Finally. And with these bombs, Samus was now complete, and it was time to get out of here. The only thing left in my way was the boss of the ship, and for a final boss, this is pretty anticlimactic. 
All that's left in my way was what I'm guessing is a prototype Mecha Ridley that isn't even off the production line yet. Tubes still connecting to it, glass shielding protecting its main power source, no legs, and hinges so rusty it can be heard a mile away. I had plenty of questions after seeing it again after 20 years. Why was this thing being made? Did they know Ridley was going to fail? Was this their backup plan? Turns out after doing some reading, Ridley actually made them. There's also a robot version of Ridley. He built it himself, which officially makes him a narcissist. Is that canon? I guess Ridley didn't have enough time to finish it before coming down to Zebus. That or he'd lost interest. And you don't even do your full-time job. But when I'm passionate about something, I see it through to the end. Father, give me legs. It? Father. This was a pretty simple boss, composed of just shoot the glowing spot until it cracks, then shoot it some more until it blows up. I almost didn't even have to move, can just base jump to dodge most of his attacks. Which is fair in a way, since this guy doesn't move either. After a good serving of well-placed missiles, Mecha Ridley goes down, but not before activating another self-destruct system. Whew. <laughs> Power's down. Oh. Shoot it! Another self-destruct? That's right, two self-destructs in one game. This time we were given five minutes, though, to get to the hangars to find a new ship. Nothing could stop us, except these two silver pirates who can actually stand up to God Mode Samus. Why don't they hire more of these guys? Once they were beat up, Samus was free to hop in the nearest ship and get out of there. Of course, there was still one pirate who was trying to get into Mother Brain's good books and pried everything he could to stop Samus. You shall not pass! With the space pirate armada now exploding behind her, Samus was free to head off into space and this time, it was over. For reals. Or was it? No, I'm joking, it's done. Now some may say, But Drew, you didn't get 100% completion rate. Once I got the final suit and bombs, I did try and leave the ship, but I just couldn't find the exit. They were that hidden. I thought I had crossed a point of no return maybe somewhere along the way. I thought beating Mecha Ridley would open an exit to leave the ship and continue exploring. I didn't know I started the end sequence. After loading my file back up, I did do more exploring and eventually found both exits from the ship. However, just look how big of an area this is and how much walking would have been required to get to one of these exits after getting the power bombs. Meanwhile, the final boss is right beside you, basically. I didn't remember. It's been 20 years. I wanted to go for 100% completion originally, but after trying to find the exits for a while, it just left a sour taste in my mouth. It made me realize the amount of backtracking that would have been required to do it, given I'd have to walk all the way back down to their lairs too to get any new items I had access to. If there was more lore to find or bosses to fight along the way, sure, I'd do it no problem, but I just wasn't interested anymore. It just didn't flow well to me after actually beating it. What they could have done was not hand you the space jump, plasma beam, and gravity suit all at once. Instead, have the player go and unlock them like everything else, giving you a reason to leave the ship and possibly find more items along the way. Sure, we found them in our adventure, but it felt like they just wanted to shoehorn them in all at once to give you that sense of power at the end. All in all, this is easily the best version to play to experience the beginning of the Metroid story. It provides more items and abilities that are now staples of the franchise, gives you a map and save points, and includes dialogue and cinematics to provide better context of what's going on around Zebus. And the only negative thing I can think of about this game is the map layout just being very linear in the sense that there's really no need to backtrack once you have the plot essential items. There's upgrades to collect later, sure, but I just wish there was some teleporting system or bigger shortcuts to at least get to every elevator region faster just to make revisiting areas easier, instead of having to go through the three other zones to reach the one you want. There's one thing I'd say the original has over the remake though, it's Justin Bailey. Speaking of the original, if you're a fan of the original, beating Zero Mission also unlocks the original game as a little bonus, making it two games in one if you're interested in playing both versions to see the differences. And with Nintendo Switch Online, this game is now super easy to access thanks to their GBA ROM library. So what do you think? Did this video change the way you see Metroid Zero Mission? Or maybe bring back some memories? Let me know what you liked and if there's anything else you'd like to see more of in future videos. 